Welcome, Yap. This is another episode of the Dead Jam Diaries. I'm really glad you're our guest today. How are you? Thank you, Neo. Thank you for having me. I'm good. I drove one and a half hours here, but I'm glad I'm finally out of the car in a tight parking spot, but I'm good to go for today. <laughs> yeah, Amsterdam is uh, quite a crazy place to drive to. It is. I, I, I mean, I come from the Netherlands, but even here there are so many bikers. They just keep on racing past your car, but it's, uh, it's going okay. So where do you come from? Uh, I originally come from Nijmegen. It's more towards the east of the country. And uh, yeah, it's a nice place, lovely views, a bit more forests and greens around. And uh, it's the oldest city of the country, actually, the, it's wow. founded by the Romans. I can imagine a lot of history there. Yeah, and every time they try, try to build something, they dig in the ground and they find, find another Roman stuff thingy and they need to hold the building for three months to research. Do, do you have some museums with the artifacts? There? Yes, we do actually. Yeah, like the Falkhof Museum has a lot of expositions of the Roman times and there are actually uh, Roman pieces you can just admire in the city uh, it, itself. As That's well. cool. Yeah. So I do not need to go to Italy. <laughs> well, it depends. The ice cream is better there. So I And the pizzas. <laughs> obviously, yes, yes, true. Yeah. Nice. Uh, so do, do you live alone there? No, I live with my wife and my daughter of one and a half now. And uh, we have a nice home for ourselves. And, uh, nice. Just bought a new barbecue so we can finally hit it wow, this awesome. summer. Yeah. How is it uh, family life there? Uh, it's quiet. So uh, people tend, to, or a lot of people like the big city, but uh, we're, we like the calm. Uh, so it's, we, we, we live in, an area, in a neighborhood with a lot of other families and children. So 10 years ago, you wouldn't find me there. But now I'm in that part of my life where I actually enjoy it and the little one can just run around on the street or no cars racing or bikes racing so there's a lot of yeah very different than Amsterdam here it's not that safe for the kids in the, uh, in the city center no no not really no so it's actually pretty good yeah good life there good decision nice I'm happy for you man thanks good to hear so um, for which company do you work for I work for Rubicon Rubicon is uh, one of the well they one of the top three consultancy firms in the Netherlands, cloud consultancy, and we purely focus on Azure. Impressive. And on the top 100 companies of the country as well. So is the Rubicon um, doing some internal managed systems or it's consulting clients? It's a consulting client. Consulting yes. clients, okay. Yeah. And you work for which client? Uh, for ABN AMRO right now, via Microsoft. So uh, Microsoft reached out to all their partners in the country looking for Profiles, and but so you're uh, actually working for Microsoft. I'm actually working. Rubicon. Yes, you're right. Yes, I'm working for Microsoft Consultancy Services, and they put me at ABN AMRO. Yeah, it's an interesting interhop. <laughs> yeah, it's like I have three employers now, or at least I have to. Uh, Do three, all three of them pay you? Unfortunately, not. No, <laughs> no. If that was the case, then well, yeah. I would have worked uh, only two days a week. No, just yeah, uh, that's, that's cool. Yeah, so it's a funny construction, but Microsoft is just in between, it's a liaison between AB and AMRO and, and Rubicon basically placing me there. So I started last year in the networking team and that's also my, my history. I come from a networking background, did uh, network and system engineering uh, administration. Uh, yeah, and I made the step to cloud after a few years and a new world opened for me. And I was How does it feel to come from the hardcore old networking to the new era of cloud yeah well that's that's uh, it was hard at first to get the mindset a uh, devops mindset basically that you can just build it destroy it build it again uh, change it alter it it doesn't work it breaks oh you just throw it away and start over and as a system network admin for small companies you thought out the plan you worked it out you build it and you didn't touch it anymore because it works. It works and they're working on it and often they don't have a lot of uh, priority in uh, redundancy or backups or whatnot. So if it ain't broke, don't try to fix it. And getting the mentality of being able to create and destroy infrastructure at your free will whenever you want, when you want, how much you want, actually took quite a few months to, to get that mindset adopted. Luckily for me, I started out with Terraform, so people like or hate it. Um, I liked it very much because it, the 
language was easy to learn. Mm -hmm. Never did a lot of programming before. PowerShelling, okay. A lot of Exchange PowerShell, which is different than the actual PowerShell. So going to hardcore, hardcore developing uh, at once, I think that was bridge too far. So I hopped into Terraform first and it was so easy to just deploy massive amounts of resources in there. So as I understand, you're developing uh, enterprise networking solution Correct. for the for the cloud, right? Correct. Yes. Nice, nice. And how does it feel like after all this time, was it hard to adopt uh, the new way of working? Because you say it took quite some time, even though the journey was quite smooth because you took some easier language to learn. Um, like, what would you recommend to network engineers um, as a key focus to, to switch to the cloud? Yeah, so networking in the cloud is, uh, compared to on-prem networking, pretty basic. You don't have VLANs, for example. Mm -hmm. So how are you going to fix that? You need, or, yeah, you need to separate your traffic from development test acceptance production. If that's the case, if maybe your company has moved to a non-production and production environment with blue green deployments, uh, blue purple. I don't know. You have all colors nowadays. Yeah, yeah, yeah. you name it. <laughs> you name it. So um, the basics are just subnetting, routing, and uh, layer two, uh, three, and four uh, firewalling, and that's the basics of cloud networking. And then you have to tie it all together. So what are the things that you need to pay attention most to when it comes to cloud versus traditional um, networking? Yeah, cloud is basically, uh, you start off that it's the big advantage for companies and the selling point is that you, you deploy it and you can connect to it. But that's also the danger because once you deploy it and you don't deploy it correctly, attackers can try mm -hmm. to infiltrate your resource or maybe your network. So um, it's good to have an idea thought, thought out, a design ready. So um, I follow the Microsoft well-architected framework for that. They have very good examples from smaller to larger networks how to deploy them. You have different topologies you can choose from. Uh, I really like the hub spoke model mm -hmm. where you have in the center a hub network where you have your core components, basically a firewall that depicts where the traffic may go and all other um, basically spoke networks or where workloads reside they connect to it and they all send their traffic to and from the hub centrally managed and the hub depicts where the traffic may go left right up down doesn't really matter and that way you can form a split between the environments you can also do some ex extra packet inspection and ids ips all the stuff all kind you, of fancy all stuff. the fancy stuff you want to do with your network traffic you can do it there nice. you make sure that all traffic goes through your controlled hub so I think this, that's a good starting point to start off with cloud networking so wondering just loudly um, all the people that are like in traditional networking they usually learn Cisco juniper f5s um, to all these vendors how do they compete now in this whole world of the clouds? You know, like, how do they keep earning money in this market? Because they were selling so much physical routers back in the days to all companies. Yeah. Um, making a move to cloud isn't done in a day or two. So you always have your on-prem environment still set up. You need to connect your on-prem environment towards the cloud. You can do that via public internet. You can, with the with Azure as an example, you can use an express route circuit where mm -hmm. you have a direct connection into the Microsoft backbone, which is more secure. It's basically plugging in a cable in Microsoft, plugging in a net, uh, cable in your uh, on-prem networking. But you still need to manage that traffic as well. You, if you start green, then of course you can go into Azure and do your stuff, but most companies have an on-prem situation so there's still some validity in physical hardware there uh, but a lot of vendors move towards uh, offering a virtual uh, network or a virtual NVA network virtual appliance mm -hmm. to use in Azure which runs on a VM that's managed by the vendor um, yeah and that way you can still use all the tools you're used to 
uh, but you're doing it in the cloud. There's only one downside to it and that it's not entirely cloud native. So there's a VM running in Azure on top of there that the software is running. That software runs software defined networking again. Yeah, on so top there is, of the software there is quite some networking. overhead basically. Yeah, there are some extra layers <coughs> attached yeah. to it. So there, it's not going to hit your performance that much because the networking is all transparent and there's host based networking in Azure as well. So you're not going to hit a lot of limits. Um, but still you have a, a lot of layers on top of each other that can, well, if one of the layers break, yeah, it's mm -hmm. up to you to troubleshoot it. So if, for example, network engineer starts his career today, would you recommend him still learning older facts of technology to have good baseline and then traverse into the cloud or directly going to the cloud? bit of both what's yeah, your opinion uh, that that's hard for me to say because i started off with the traditional networking and i'd say yes have that as a background but yeah i can imagine not everyone starting uh, having background knowledge of networking um, get into some subnetting some basic routing static routes dynamic routes dns uh, those basics get to know them mm -hmm. um, work your way through the az 700 course that's what is AZ700? That's the certification for Azure, I think, network a virtual network administrator associate, or at least the mm -hmm. Azure networking certification, where you get to know all the Azure resources that are, well, part of the networking. That's stack awesome. Microsoft Azure. is all the time updating their updating certification. All the time. Yes. I correct. heard now that there is also some kind of support connectivity certification, like specialist if you want to support the connectivity yes. from on-prem to the cloud yes and I think that's seven also in the 700 range so mm -hmm. they looks like they reserve the AC 700 range for oh, networking. Right. so they're scoping like this kind of specialties into exams so people can easier learn the subject yes and that you have proof that you have the knowledge to to work in Azure and know what all the resources do mm -hmm. um, so I think that's a good Good yeah, it's, it's, it's quite logical because if from the perspective of the cloud, there are so many services and you're not expected as an engineer to know all of them. So I can imagine that in a year or so, there's going to be like just specialty for Kubernetes and the job for Kubernetes on Azure, networking yes. on Azure, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And I think that's a good thing because yes. it, it will play the strengths of a lot of people. Because I like networking, I do a lot of connectivity, mm -hmm. but don't come to me with Java. I don't understand it, and I really, I don't get excited. Yeah, for when you when you say cloud, it's all general, right? It's easier when it's scoped yes, to yeah, when it's scoped to 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 an expertise. But even in connectivity or networking, there's a lot of differences because you can focus on front end, uh, back end, but uh, APIs are also a big part. Uh, of that and I think APIs are a whole different world than firewalling or Definitely. providing access uh, so even in networking you're not done when you're doing networking you can then still pick your path where you want to go that's also really nice and if you really want to have the whole picture then it's always an option to move to an architecture posi architectural position to just yeah yeah design definitely. those parts of a company I, I believe that like how you prosper through the career, one part gets you to another part. Uh, people get curious, right? Yeah. Someone starts from with the networking and they say, "Whoa, shit! There is whole another world of things that I can try." <laughs> yeah. That's, but it's uh, also nice to stay loyal. <laughs> well, it's it's what you like. I mean, uh, I know people that really like just programming, and they will they you won't make them happy. They want to keep they doing. They want to keep doing programming. They don't Reasonable. want to make designs. They do they do some designs because they have to to support their their coding, but they don't want to. Yeah, do. it's it's very subjective. Comes from personality, exactly. I guess. Yeah, yes. Yeah. 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 Nice, nice. All right. So I was wondering the the clients that you are serving, those projects that they are doing, how challenging it is on your daily basis to. To like collaborate with people because I can imagine in big organizations not everyone are now on the same knowledge level it's like you took one big pot you shake it you know it's like people from the old world from the new world how do you experience all those teams and cultures 
um, it's sometimes it's a bit tough because we are all we're all going reaching for the same goals and from the part where I am at is just providing connectivity to everyone that lands on Azure mm -hmm. they need to plug in be able to connect to the internet to services on-prem maybe to their own services in Azure that are normally blocked they need to work they need to be unblocked that's the entire goal but with on-prem networking as well you have workplace management you have so many stakeholders involved uh, that trying to get everyone aligned is very hard but i think that's that's the key factor so part of connectivity is communication yeah that's also between people you need a lot of communication so i i start off getting to know the design how, how the network is set up try to find some small improvements and if that's not possible just talk to people where if they are hitting roadblocks and if yes where and how can we overcome them and sometimes you come to the decision that it's best to just redesign a part of the network, re-implement it. Understandable. And migrate it. And it just takes a lot of talking to a lot of people. And we just need to create a win-win situation, make some compromises back and forth. And yeah, then we can basically, I'm distracted by that sound. <laughs> <laughs> So that's that's the, that's the hard part. You're more talking than actually designing or developing sometimes. So you're saying that being a modern cloud engineer or DevOps engineer, it takes some kind of knowing the political aspects and a lot of soft skills due to communication, stakeholder management, etc. Yes, I think the bigger the company gets, the more you have to rely also on soft skills and how to move around in the political playing field. But still, if you're not up to that, you you will again be you will be able to find your place. If you just want to develop, you just develop. Um, I like the political side a bit more. I like to talk as well. That's why I'm here, um, and I like to to have just talks talk to people about stuff, lay down the problems, find a solution, make a design. And while also working my way towards a more architectural role, mm -hmm. that's what I like. So that's why I'm, uh, I'm yeah, now telling you about this today. Thank you. So for these people that uh, do not like really to get involved into political things, um, to have all daily conversations that are quite long and convince someone, like if you just land in this big organization, how can you really choose? Because I believe that it's just thrown at you 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 have in the deep yeah thrown in the deep right so how what what was your experience when you came first time in like big enterprise so the biggest enterprise was actually abn emro when i joined so the cloud center of excellence has more than 200 people working in it well wow, that's massive they're all working on being able to onboard all the workloads everyone else so 200 people are just building the platform mm -hmm. And that's only building the platform. So yeah, where do you start? You have more than 12 teams. I don't know each team. I don't know who's in whose team. And with the bigger organizational units in Active Directory, with all the abbreviations, you don't know where they're part of. So just focus on where you land. You land in the team. What's the responsibility of the team? What are the tasks that are expected from them? Um, at least get a buddy. Do not bite too much, basically. Yeah, just chew off small bits at a time. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, to yeah to keep that reference. Uh, small bites. They don't expect you to know everything within two weeks or two months. Uh, when I joined, I just got the message: take your time. Some people it can take three to six months before you get the hang of it. Wow. And well, after three months, I thought I was getting up to speed. And then I started biting off bigger chunks and I was like, oh, I'm back to square one with this part. And <laughs> there are so many things that are, uh, that, that, that are going on and you have to filter it out yourself. If you don't look out, your whole agenda is filled with meetings, knowledge sessions uh, and whatnot. Where's your time to learn, to engineer, to program? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's uh, in a bigger environment, you really have to watch yourself and people expect that as well from you. How do you get recognized in this such a huge organization? How to get a voice? Like how to pass 
the idea that you know it's right, but you need to convince all other 199 engineers? I think that depends on the person. Uh, each has their own way. There are people that just tell it bluntly to everyone. Uh, I myself, I'm more into just touching the water, see what other people think of it. Because I can have an opinion, but it's more important that we all work towards the same goal yeah. and that we're aligned on that. So if I think uh, a certain network pattern is not a really smart move to do, I'm not going to tell everyone that's a stupid idea. I'm just I, first I want to figure out what the reasoning is behind it because maybe it's a compliance or a governance reason that they chose a certain way to provide connectivity for resource X, just mm -hmm. as an example. If that's the case, you cannot change much about it because you have to change maybe the law or another government's model. So you can provide a technical solution, if it's, but it's a bus if it's a business issue, you're not going to solve the business issue with the technical solution. Yeah. So first touch the waters, gather some thoughts and ideas from other people as well. But if you hear from a lot of people, well, yeah, that's strange. Maybe we can look into that. The second issue you're facing is that no one has time because everyone has filled backlogs there. I mean, our backlogs is filled for, for the next half year. Uh, and we're just trying to prioritize things in. And it always works out. But still, people, the first reaction is, oh, I don't have time. Just, oh, maybe in three months. But then you, the whole momentum, you lose the whole momentum. So then it's important to pick that up, make At a pitch, point. Yeah. pitch your team if they want to work on it. If you're the only one in the team that wants to carry the change or the, the thing you want to introduce, it's really hard to get it backed up in the entire organization. And then you have a product owner and if he does his job well, he goes to the business, explains the business value of your change you want to implement. And he has to make sure then that you get the time to do it. For that, yeah. yeah. So that's a, a sort of how Roughly. I approach it. Yeah. yeah, interesting. So it's not really an uh, easy task as in traditional corporations when everyone are just in the same mindset. Here, like with this new DevOps team, you have so many teams doing different things, contributing to the same value. But it's as, as I understood, the vision is clear at the top, but how it gets its roots down and down, people are sometimes being a bit mixed up uh, between, you know, how do we exactly navigate? If this guy knows this is important, how to get the voice to the right side of the organization, right? Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. And because you're in a cloud center of excellence, you're also in between the business and the developers because mm -hmm. they need to land their workload on Azure. And I mean, I had to adopt the DevOps mentality or the mindset, but they also have to do that because in the traditional world, so to say, they could develop, they got a VM or any piece of compute storage mm -hmm. networking, and they were able to just code and in the cloud, it's expected from them as well to manage their own infrastructure, to be able to determine correct sizing, uh, uh, work on cost management, do not spend too much. Uh, if something breaks, how to troubleshoot it. So that's also a big, big leap they have to take in, in learning how to work in the cloud. So that's also a factor that comes into play. So there's a lot of things going on, uh, moving at a fast pace, even for a big corporation. Uh, so it's pick your battles, basically. Yeah. Wow, yes. So I can tell that <clears throat> being actually engineer today takes quite different core values than being engineer five or ten years ago, right? Yeah, yeah, I agree. Definitely. Yeah. So let's imagine, like dream a little bit that now we do not know anything about IT. Where would you start if you consider that you need soft skills and hard skills? Wow. Um, wow. That's a really good question. So where to begin? So first of all, find your interest in IT. So what do you like? Do you like to design websites, yes or no, or 
fiddle around with your, I don't know, with your Wi-Fi at home that's not working, trying to get into it, why it's not working, <laughs> only to find out that you have a crappy router, I don't know. Um, so first, like a specific discipline of IT, right? Yeah, I think that's a good way to focus on and then dive deeper into that. I mean, programming or coding is going to be a part of a lot of things, even in networking. When mm -hmm. I started, I was just clicking around on the web pages of switches, and now uh, they just... Uh, Python is a good language to, yeah, to so start off. Yeah, so technical with. things, but then it comes this very different part than just getting into organization and say, okay, I just found a call for you, but now you need also to sell yourself. Yes. Right? What about that? So, um, best way to learn languages or techniques is to try them out. Do it at home. If you don't have a home lab, build a VM or at least start building a VM mm -hmm. so you get to know what it's like to have a virtualized environment to deploy stuff on. Uh, you can host your own repo and do Git on it, learn Git. Mm -hmm. um, all those basics you can do at home yourself, start off with. There are a lot of guides you can, you can read if you want, but you can watch YouTube videos as well on how to do that. Just make it your own. And start working on some projects and if you don't I mean if you you're going to do a bachelor or a master's in IT of course you get a lot of stuff and the, the paper you get at the end is proof that you have learned a learn stuff. and have an yeah. amount of knowledge about IT but still that doesn't give you a lot of experience so the only way to get experience is either in the work field but if they are if, if you have trouble getting hired Create stuff, show them that. I mean, if you're a photographer and you want to get work, what do you show? Your portfolio. Mm -hmm. So build your own digital portfolio with the stuff you like. That, that's a good advice. Yeah. Yes. So I, as I'm hearing, there is, well, we mentioned a lot of communication and, well, politics, governance, etc., etc. What kind of approach would you take to gain the soft skills that you need, considering that you're going to talk to X number of people tomorrow when you get the job? Well, you also have, you have to have confidence in the fact that you know your stuff. Mm -hmm. and you, um, the problem with a lot of people in IT is that they know what they don't know. That's yeah, yeah. And they are going to doubt themselves because there's so much they don't know, but they forget the fact that they already know a lot. And that's the imposter syndrome. And I think a lot of people in IT have that because there's always someone better at something. And it's a good thing to compare yourself, to pull yourself up, to become better, but don't forget that you're good at something. Um, and in interviews, they often just uh, want to know your thought process to how to solve a problem. So they provide you with a problem and they ask you, okay, how do you come with, up with a solution or what is your solution to this problem? Mm -hmm. There's no one way to solve a problem. There are Always many, many, ways. many ways to yeah. solve a problem. And there are ways to solve a problem quick. There are ways to solve a problem good, uh, and all everything in between. And they just want to pick your brain to see how your thought process goes. Because if you say I'm going to solve the problem by calling the help desk and they solve it for me, well, I don't think they're going to hire you because they can make the call themselves. themselves. Yeah. yeah, just Understandable. maybe a, a stupid example, but um, they just want to get to know you, and don't be scared. Just tell them. And uh, so social skills is not, you don't have to be, uh, you don't have to take part in parties or drinks with your colleagues if you don't want to. Uh, but on a professional level, we're all working towards the same goal and your voice is as valuable as the others. And if you think an idea is not good enough and you have arguments for that, just bring it to the table and people will listen to you. Don't be scared. Mm -hmm. As, as, as someone of, with, with your experience, as I understood, you have 10 plus years, right, in, in networking. Um, yeah. in, in this huge community where people are now seeking, like, uh, North Stars, people that they're going to look at and then understand how they prospered in their career, how do you share what you know with everyone that are requiring that knowledge and still don't have it? Well, I'm, I'm not... Uh, actively involved yet in communities. Um, it's also because 
we just had our daughter one and a half it's a busy time as well in yeah private I, life. I, I believe it uh, takes a lot of time uh, energy as well sleep oh, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> um, no but that's uh, but I also want to focus on that I, 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 I try to remain or to, to have a good work-life balance yeah it's very important I mean you cannot be successful at work if you are crushed in your private time right exactly and the other way around is exactly the it's same, the same. Um, I think there are already a lot of people online that explain the basics to you. Networking is a lot of, it's like math, so it's a lot of facts. Um, there's also networking, not a single way to do stuff, but mm -hmm. the basics are all facts. And I mean, TCP IP hasn't changed since the 80s, I think. Yeah, yeah. from the moment they released by the American government. <laughs> by DARPA, yes, yeah, yeah. It, was, it was developed and it's basically the same, but we just encapsulated a lot more protocols around it. Um, so also ports, port numbers and networking are quite fixed for, for services, HTTP, HTTPS, SSL, etc., etc. Uh, SSL, yeah, yeah, you, yeah, you name it. Um, so those facts, you can just study them, but it's even better to apply them. Um, Check. Yeah. So what what do you consider perhaps knowing your current status? What are you seeking as continuous development in your career? Like you want to specialize as a deeper expert in networking in Azure? You want to learn maybe some other cloud platform? What's your vision? I think once you get to know networking, it doesn't really matter where you do it. Mm -hmm. uh, if it's in AWS uh, or Google Cloud or Azure or on-prem, it's, well, connecting everything. Mm -hmm. um, so I want to dive more deeply into security um, yeah, and architecture. That's basically my ambition. Architecture, okay, nice. Yeah. So <clears throat> I can relate that security is very tied to networking as well, so that is kind of a logical step. Uh, but what, what would be some kind of KPIs that you still do not know and you would like to know? A uh, big part of now, uh, because security uh, is, is a layered um, model, like an onion. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, you throw up a lot of barriers to prevent people from getting in, mm -hmm. malicious actors. And in the past, we had the network as the primary line of defense. So you had a firewall at the edge of your network, it would block or allow connections, inbound, outbound. Once you were inside, a lot of networks were just open because we trust everyone inside. And now we're moving to, luckily, a zero trust model where every part of the connection is checked mm -hmm. all the time. You check explicitly if someone's allowed to do something. That shifts your shifts your primary line of defense to the identity, to the user, to the person accessing data or applications. Um, so in that regard, zero trust is something I really want to dive deep into. And then the part of identity providers being able to properly have a... Yeah, it's, it's kind of interconnected. It is all interconnected, makes sense. yes. Makes sense. Um, I believe that there are also some certifications about identity in Azure, right? Yes. You can get specialized for it. It's a, it's a nice uh, next step. Yes, it's the, I think the SC300, the Identity Access Administrator. Uh, it's focused on Azure AD identity protection. Um, actually, I'm up for it. I'm going to plan the, the exam in a couple of weeks. So. Yeah, that's, but that's what, what are your strategies when you're like studying for the exam after all these years passing the numerous certifications and going through the universities? Uh, do you have some advice for people? Well, just Microsoft has great resources. They're free to use. Uh, use them. They have excellent learning paths you can follow. Mm -hmm. um, and don't get mad at yourself if you don't get it in one go. If you haven't worked with a technique, it's very hard to to have um, to relate to to practice if you wor worked with a technique for a couple of years then the certificate is more uh, a cherry on top than actually uh, you then that you need it to to get to work somewhere uh, it's just proof that you've worked with it and it's easy to obtain so uh, do the learnings watch uh, study crams uh, I, I forgot his name but uh, John Sobel. John Savile, exactly, has a lot of study crams for each, almost every certification in Azure. 
uh, watch those. He is re really good at explaining all the stuff. Um, yeah, and get experience with the exams. I know they're they're very uh, strict in what you're allowed. You can do them at home and or at a test center. Uh, doesn't matter where you are. It's not nice to do them because you're uh, well. You're watched. Uh, they check if you if you don't have any uh, objects on you. If you cannot cheat. Um, so there's a bit. I always sense a big part of pressure on me when I do the exam. That if I look the wrong way, maybe they fail me instantly. Yeah. So that is also the nerves. You you can only get them under control by doing it. Um, Makes sense. For if you're following an education, you get discounts as well. And follow Microsoft on his build conferences and other conferences because they often have a challenge, a cloud mm -hmm. skills challenge, uh, where you have to follow um, learning paths. And if you succeed in that, you get a free certificate. Uh, well, that's, voucher, that's, that's voucher. cool. That's cool. I, I, I got only one comment about the home versus uh, going to the... Pearson Wu Center, yeah, yeah. yeah because um, I'm thinking if if you're doing the exam at home and something goes wrong with your connection, you're stuck. And if you're in the training center, you can directly call the officer which is operating the facility, getting fixed for you. Correct. Yeah, that's it's a bit easier. A lot easier. So luckily we have good infrastructure in this country. Yes. Uh, <laughs> but still, I I just run a cable to my laptop. To be sure, no Wi-Fi whatsoever. If you get some interference and it, it drops too much, no, I'm not going to take that risk. So sometimes there's a, a 15 meter cable. Well, there, there are no house. RJ45 connectors for uh, modern laptops anymore. <laughs> no, they do the hub and USB to yes. Yeah, it's it's uh, yeah, it's all USB C now. Yeah. yeah, crazy things. Crazy. It's like if if you look from this perspective, how much technology is evolving every day. It's hard even to keep a track with it you know yeah um, yeah and you, you don't have to I mean actually you don't depends how much you want to be on top of the things yeah exactly absolutely if your phone breaks then it's a good time to see what what's in the market at that moment but if you test phones regularly oh, that's a different story of course it's also your interest I mean uh, I'd like to follow uh, a lot of the news, but there, there's so much going on. Yeah, there is so much going on. Um, what, what would be, for example, a good advice to stay scoped to the area of interest? Do you have some channels that you follow the news at? Um, how do you get informed and targeted about what's your interest? Yeah, well, there's a lot of news and uh, I don't have any Facebook or other social media except mm -hmm. for LinkedIn. So I'm not getting any articles from there. Uh, I have a Feedly account. So with Feedly, Feedly you can uh, just basically connect to a lot of news outlets uh, in the area of choice. Mm -hmm. I pick technology, so you're getting a lot of. So it's kind of category thing that you can choose from. Exactly. Yes. So I took technology, and then you can filter out what in technology you want to know. Wow, oh, that's that's so, really cool. Yeah, that's a lot really into. Cool. Uh, to follow gaming news as well that's in there and you just get all the articles uh, each day you can scroll through and see what you want to read um, yeah um, Microsoft blog posts are good about uh, the resources they are developing for the cloud if you're mm -hmm. working on the cloud it's good to be on top of that as well um, yeah some general news sites in, in tech are all always I think well you have bleeping computer so I'm more into security. Uh, Why well, I, I can cram in a whole list, but I think uh, yeah, good, good enough. So, what's um, have you been more excited working on prem or now in the cloud, uh, knowing the load information that you need to understand here and there? Well, on prem was was I, if I look back to it, it's more playground than uh, cloud is also playing around, but. You have certain boundaries. You have to keep. You have to align with other people a lot. Uh, changes are can be breaking real fast, uh, which is nice. Gives a bit of pressure to do it well. And on-prem was um, yeah. 
sometimes I have the feeling you have more freedom, you have more capabilities in mm -hmm. networking. Take for example VLANs or multicast, VoIP protocols, you have a lot more to play around with. What was what was more error prone? What was easier to break? On prem. On prem, yes. Why? Uh, because it's uh, you have the hardware to manage. You have to manage the firmware on top of that, all the configuration, uh, and in the cloud it's uh, abstracted for you. So Microsoft in Azure. So if something breaks in your data center, you need to go there. Yes, you need replace to replace it. Replace it in the middle of the night, wow. or have some decent failover set up. But that's also stuff you need to work out. Uh, make sure that everyone knows about it, share the knowledge, and in cloud that's all handled for you. So that concern of stuff breaking or not working because of uh, some, some basic reasons like a firmware uh, update that, that has gone wrong, you don't have those concerns anymore in cloud. So it's offloaded, right? It's offloaded. Yeah. Nice, nice. And that's, yeah, that's nice. So the cloud is actually nicer. Yeah. So did, did it take you back in the days some uh, actual real cases when something broke and you had to wake up during the night to replace stuff? Um, yes. So uh, I had a customer that had a redundant Hyper-V cluster. Their choice. I, I would go for VMware, but that's, VMware. that's my personal well, professional <coughs> opinion. I think it's a bit more expensive, the VMware. Uh, on this side, you just purchase the Hyper-V yeah. server. Exactly. Yeah, well, so they uh, they had uh, two co-locations in the data center. They were interconnected with dark fiber, very nice connection. Dark fiber. Dark, dark fiber. So they, wow. had a, they had a single fiber in the fiber optic cable or single color, mm -hmm. and that was dedicated for their traffic. So the latency, uh, I think it was 60 kilometers in between, was less than one millisecond. And wow, that's sick. just blew up. It was crazy. So they they had a, a firewall cluster, Sophos firewall cluster, work, uh, working in high availability. So we had a main and a backup node. And um, the main node was in Eindhoven, the backup node in the Sertogenbos, in Den Bosch, the data center locations. Um, but they need to communicate changes to each other. So you make a change on the main unit and it needs to reflect on the backup unit. If you update the cluster, uh, they, they fill over, take over from each other. And the issue they had is that they were out of sync. They couldn't get it back into sync. So I dove into the network to find out what was wrong. Um, and in the end, apparently the, the dedicated VLAN they used for syncing all the data was just advertised to all interfaces. So oh packets God. were going everywhere. Uh, looking at one of the, uh, I had to do a lot of Wireshark. That's, that's also a very good tool to get used to network packets, to just dissect them. And we saw so many blocked packets, retransmits and whatnot going on. Um, and I had a network admin at the customer side who was a bit scared to do some changes. Um, and I told him, make these changes and then we can uh, they had, uh, then we can upgrade your core switch which needed to be updated but in order to update the core switch we needed to have a stable cluster mm -hmm. which it wasn't so he went to work and a couple of weeks later we had that change on a Saturday in the data center and we went there and they started updating the core switch and all connectivity dropped well everything dropped so they had around 500 customers that needed to access the software again on Monday. Uh, but without a firewall, there was no connectivity. I, I can imagine that's a huge loss of, ma of funds. Uh, yes. Uh, so And uh, reputation. And re <laughs> yeah, reputation as well. So we fixed it by just cr only booting the primary firewall, the main firewall. It was back up. Everything came back online. The, the update was postponed and there was a critical uh, vulnerability in there but yeah we needed to take the risk just to get everything back up and running again and then a few weeks later later I got a call at 10 o'clock in the evening uh, yeah we tried to update but there's nothing's working and we luckily have a DSL backup backdoor line where we can enter and, and yeah um, everything hit the fan so it took me four hours to dig through the physical layer into the basically from layer one, two, three, four, five to six to determine how the connectivity worked. And then I found out that he 
didn't remove the VLAN and it still advertised everywhere. Yeah, so they got a big bill for that, of course. But, but yeah, well, that's how it works. It's Luckily, no more these cases in this modern cloud. Exactly. If, if, so, if something gets this wrong, that means yes, that it's on the provider side. It's on the provider side. So that's so good on, on the cloud side, the shared responsibility model. So the more you use cloud native, the less responsible you are for actually running the stuff. You're just responsible for running what's on top of it. Like an Azure Firewall, you just manage the rule set. That's it. You don't have to manage software. You don't have to manage uh, how many uh, 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 NICs you, you have. You don't have to scale out. It all goes out automatically. You can push 30 Amazing. gigabits through it. Well, get a Palo Alto that pushes 30 gigabits. Well, I think uh, you can reach deep into your pockets to get, get <laughs> such an appliance. <laughs> yes, so, yes. Yeah. Uh, so cloud is, is the way to go. It's the nice. Future. So you would definitely also recommend your friends that are not so deep into IT to perhaps if they have interest in technology, dive a little bit, read upon it. Yes. Can yes. catch their uh, attention. Low code is taking off as well. Uh, and basically it's, uh, all, from my understanding, I'm in networking, not in low code, but uh, uh, there's a layer of abstraction put on top of coding where you just click in the steps you want to take in your software. And if you really want to get into it, you can still dive into the code and change that. And it's a really easy way to get into coding as well. Um, BI, business intelligence, getting, making data visual, that's, that's really important because there's so much data. What are we going to do with it? We, we don't know what to do with it. Exactly. If you like to build a dashboard, that sounds really simple, but it's very hard to build a good dashboard get into it, dive into BI, dive into uh, data analytics, data science maybe. Uh, yeah, a lot of things to do. Security as well. And security is a lot more than technology. There's information security as well, compliance, get, uh, make sure that every all, all processes are being followed, that you mitigate all your risks in information security. So many options to go through. Yeah. Well, well. I hope that people that are going to listen to us really take a bit of a flavor of everything and decide open up to them what's the best. Because there is not only one option, definitely. There are so many choices. Correct. Yeah, I yes. agree. Totally. Well, I really want to thank you for sharing your story. I really enjoyed um, everything that you shared with us. Um, thank you for having me. Thanks, a good for, time. thanks for coming, definitely. And we're going to keep in touch. I'm going to definitely recommend you to every enterprise company that is looking oh, for it's good to hear. Thank network you consultants. Much. Okay, cool. Thanks <laughs> yes. for having me. Thanks, man. Good one. Okay. All right.